sing that? Libby, you want to sing after Carolyn? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. When he walks among us, all that he does, all of his mercy and all of his love, if the pen of the writer could write every day, even this world could never contain. Blessed. The warmth in the winter, the flowers in spring, the laughter of summer, the changing of leaves, food on my table, a good place to sleep, clothes on my back. And shoes on my feet Oh, I have been blessed Oh, I have been blessed God so good to me Precious are His thoughts of you and me No way I could count them There's not enough and so I'll just thank you for being so kind. God has been good, so good. I have been blessed. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross, bearing our sins. Redeeming the lost He sent back His Spirit For those who believe A fountain of life For others to see How I have been blessed Oh, I have been blessed God so good to me Precious are His thoughts of you and me. No way I could count them. There's not enough time. And so I'll just thank Him for being so kind. God has been good, so good. I have been blessed. daily bread it's always unfolding I'm continually fed my light and my salvation whom shall I fear the strength of my life with my enemies draw near I have been blessed to me precious are his thoughts of you and me no way I could count them there's not enough time and so I'll just thank you for being so kind God has been good so
so good I have been blessed Arms that will raise A voice that can talk Hands that can touch Legs that can walk Ears that can listen Eyes that can see Oh, I've got to praise Him As long as I breathe For I have been blessed Father and mother Nurtured and raised My sisters and brothers Memories made Our pastor to lead us This altar to pray Stripes that can heal And blood that still saves Oh, I have been blessed Precious are His thoughts of you and me No way I could count them There's not enough time And so I'll just thank Him for being so kind God has been good, so good My shoulder to lean on when I am down A rock where He leads me when I'm overwhelmed The place where He hides me under His wing He's not just a song, He's the reason I sing are his thoughts of you and me no way I could count them there's not enough time and so I'll just thank you for being so kind God has been good so good I have been blessed Searching for 
It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am, cause you're perfect. and Sister Stroman with us tonight. Going to be with us next week. If we can all stand together, we will go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we have gathered together tonight, Lord, in your name. Lord, what other name is there, Lord, except your name? Through you there is salvation, Lord. Through you, there's deliverance and healing for us. Lord, where else could we turn to except for, to you, the author and finisher of our faith? And Lord, we ask you that you be with us tonight, Lord. And Lord, that you would come upon the minister as he speaks your words. Lord, that it be your words and not his words. And Lord, that we would be, that our hearts would, be, would burn within us, Lord. 
And Lord, that we would understand what you have to say to the church in this hour. Lord, there's many going to and fro. Lord, but are they really hearing your voice? And Lord, we ask you tonight, Lord, that we can have that ear that we need to hear. Not our, not our ear on our side of our head, but in another ear. And Lord, we ask tonight, Lord, that you be with the ones that couldn't come tonight, the ones that are listening, the ones that aren't listening. Lord, that you would bless them where they're at. And you see their needs, each one of them, Lord, the needs that they have in their bodies and spiritual needs. Lord, you, we pray that you meet those needs tonight. And Lord, you see the ones in here, Lord, that, are, that have needs, Lord, we pray that we all go home different. Brother Branham said we either come leave one way or the other. And Lord, we pray that we leave different, that we feel we leave upright. We, we leave with a greater understanding of who you are. Lord, we ask all these things tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's good to be with you all again. And we're thankful to the Lord for the opportunity. In his sweet and precious name. We uh, were fortunate to be here this morning also. Not in church, but in the fellowship hall. Uh, we were uh, feasting on uh, the manna. Not just bread and... <laughs> I said bread and wine. <laughs> but uh, on the wonderful word of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. So... <laughs> I hope nobody misunderstood that part, <laughs> because uh, wine uh, isn't only alcohol, it can also be uh, a revelation Amen. that sparkles within your heart, so that you can enjoy the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> we uh, have, of course, lots of greetings from Norway, <laughs> and uh, we're so thankful to the Lord for the fellowship here in Bloomington and uh, where Brother Tim was asking if we would ever think of coming to Norway this year, no, to the States this year. <laughs> well, sometimes people wonder if we would come to Norway <laughs> because we are traveling people. <laughs> but still, we are more in Norway than anywhere else, we, at one time anyway. <clears throat> but uh, some places, they try to beat that. So we stayed uh, more than two months in Kenya in, uh, in uh, September and October. <coughs> and uh, they wanted even to keep us longer, but uh, we felt that we needed to, uh, to press on because uh, there were a lot of expectations around. And we were thankful that uh, they enjoyed our ministry so well so when you preach every day for six weeks, that's uh, a lot of preaching. But uh, we had never seen and been with the people before. Uh, so we had a lot to take from. Uh, new and old, isn't that what they say? Yeah, so uh, we're so happy to minister to the people. And uh, they have a wonderful person. If you ever have time to pray for someone, there's a pastor in Kenya, in Nairobi. He's called Brother uh, Gasper Aswin. Gasper Aswin. And of course, there's another brother up there also called Brother Martin Wanyana. Uh, very dedicated people. Pastors of different churches. And uh, we were very happy to be with them. And so we're just there to fill in and, uh, and help. I'm just a helper, but I'm glad to be one. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why, why I'm here in uh, Bloomington also. I'm your helper. And I hope that we can say something that will uh, make you rejoice. And not just for a day or two, but you can rejoice for the rest of your life. Because we have a gospel that is really eternal. I know that the gospel will have a season and uh, it will end uh, because uh, 
we're not going to preach salvation in inter eternity, uh, then it's all over. Then the goal is met. But until that day, we, we have a job to do so that as many as possible can reach out and grasp the Lord. So uh, we just pray to be an attraction wherever we go. And of course the attraction is not my features, my face and my body. Uh, the, the attraction is the Spirit of Christ. So if you can find Christ in me, then uh, you found it. And I hope you don't have to search a very long time to find that part. <laughs> right? So, without any other delays, uh, greetings from Norway and uh, also greetings from Georgia, the people in Georgia, Brother Tower, uh, Brother Keith Paz, and uh, the people down there, they were very happy to see us. Brother Frank Speakman is greeting you because he came over and spent a weekend with us. So, uh, he's, uh, he's uh, still going strong and uh, loving the Lord. So we're happy to be in fellowship with them. And of course, we're happy to be here in fellowship with you. Um, uh, tonight, uh, I, I want to speak on a certain subject. I have always dealt and felt it is important for the people to make sure that they are filled with the Holy Ghost. And I believe that you have been properly taught on the Holy Ghost, the experience, so that you can receive and believe that you have the Holy Spirit. It is no hocus pocus. Uh, Paul said one day in Ephesus, in chapter 19, the book of Acts, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Because you believe and you receive. And the people didn't even know about the Holy Spirit. And then he asked, what kind of a baptism do you have? And they say they were baptized with John the Baptist baptism. And they said, oh my, so that's why you don't know about the Holy Spirit. And he preached to them Jesus Christ. And of course, the experience of the receiving the Holy Spirit. And when they heard about that, that they needed to be rebaptized in the name of Jesus Christ, they all went down to the river, got baptized there. And then when Paul laid hands on them, they all received the Holy Spirit. And now they were filled with God's Spirit. And that is your security. And when you read Ephesians, and now if you, on the brick wall there, there might come up some uh, handwriting on the wall. <laughs> all right, my God. <laughs> oh yeah, you're a God. Okay, that's okay. I know he's a God. <laughs> But uh, uh, <clears throat> that, that's the song, probably. Yeah. Yeah? Oh, that's, that's okay. You can keep singing inside you. You're not going to sing louds. <laughs> but that's okay. But I want to go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 and 30. Because there, Paul is speaking to the Ephesians. He's a very good brother. And uh, everything he's preaches on and wrote down really makes sense because uh, he speaks very straight forward. Uh, he have a knowledge that some people had a little problem because they were not as uh, well, uh, should we say, taught as Paul was because he was one time in the Sanhedrin, <coughs> was under the feet of Gamaliel. So we had some uh, skills and understanding. But I believe that when he was preaching the gospel, he did not really want to preach knowledge. He wanted to preach Christ to them so that they could understand. And therefore, he was a very firm believer in receiving the Holy Spirit. When you read uh, Acts chapter 9, you find out that uh, when Paul met Jesus, of course, he met the angel of the Lord speaking in the name of Jesus Christ at the road to Damascus. Then uh, he went to Damascus and he got healed because he got blind, seeing into this light. And then he was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And right there with Ananias, he got also filled with the Holy Ghost. So remember now, you don't need to walk around for months and years waiting on the Holy Ghost to come and 
dump upon you. You receive it right when you get the understanding, I can receive the Holy Spirit. And then it's yours. Praise the Lord. And Paul, he got that then. And when he preached the gospel, he never told the people, because when I came into the Pentecostal church uh, some years ago, they said, well, you, you repent and we'll check you out to see if you can be baptized. And uh, after a while of trial, uh, they, they want to check if you really are a Christian, then they will baptize you. And then they'll say, well, then now, now you can maybe try to seek for the Holy Spirit. It might not come, it might take a long time, and uh, you have to do a lot of different things to make sure you have the Holy Spirit. But that's not really what the Bible teaches. Peter said it very simple. Repent, be baptized in Jesus' name, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And that day, 3,000 people received it. Hey, it was not difficult. It was how the scripture is to be explained. And if the people have stayed that way, then there would never be an issue about, do I have the Holy Spirit? But since uh, an enemy came in and started sowing false seed, then of course the, the justification, sanctification, infilling of the Holy Ghost uh, disappeared. And now you have to work according to the dignity and the, the priesthood and whatever system that was in charge. And you may never receive any peace inside. But I'm glad for the Reformation that Luther found out that just I live by faith. And uh, Wesley said we need to live a holy life dedicated to him, sanctification. And then here, the last part of it, Pentecost, and the people started getting filled with the Holy Ghost mass again, like massive. And it went all over the globe, and now it's been over the globe for more than a hundred years. Uh, so uh, we should be pretty prepared for the, the coming of the Lord. Make sure that we have the Holy Spirit in our lives. And uh, Paul, he is now writing and he's saying here, Let no corrupt speech proceed out of your mouth. But such as is good for, ed for edifying, as the need may be, so we should edify each other, that it may give grace to them that hear. And then it comes a warning, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, in whom you were sealed unto the day of redemption. <coughs> so here, it speaks about that the Holy Spirit is received. And when it is received, it becomes a seal. Well, we know that in the Bible, and especially in the book of Revelation, it speaks about seals. And the seals, the way the word is written out, it really means that it is a security in it. If you have a document, you buy, you buy property and you get a deed and uh, it is stamped or sealed by governmental officials and now the property is yours and if someone else comes to claim it, you can just show them the paper. Well, don't show them the real one, show them a copy because they might steal it <laughs> and run away with it, right? <laughs> So therefore, but you have a sealed document that it is your property. And then they cannot come and, and claim it. And uh, when you are sealed with the Holy Spirit, of course the devil don't like that. So he wants to tell you, you are not filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> right? And uh, in the Philippines, they made a big issue out of being filled with the Holy Spirit or filled with the Holy Ghost. So they thought that it was two different spirits. But it is really the same one. The Holy Ghost is more used in the Old Testament. Holy Ghost, an old terminology. And then when uh, the New Testament started spreading out, it uh, turned over to be the Holy Spirit. But it is the same thing. So uh, don't worry about if you're filled with the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. 
because you are filled with God's spirit that is holy. <laughs> All right? Okay. So when it says here that we are filled with Holy, holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit of God, that tells you that you are really secure. And in the scriptures, in the Bible, security is something when God says he is mine, then he is mine. So you are God's. And, and it's, but some people must say, but what if he falls by the wayside? What if he does this or that? Well, if God chose to fill someone with the Holy Spirit, remember, you cannot fill yourself with the Holy Spirit. It is God who does the job. And when he does it, then you become his tool, and you are his tool for the rest of your life, whether you like it or not. <laughs> and if you act badly, if you really don't want to live a Christian-like life, then might, God might take you home, take you home early. Well, remember, your days are numbered, right? So I hope you understand that part. And when I say God may take you home early, <laughs> That's uh, not that God had to change his program because he saw you before the foundation of the world. So he knew if you were going to turn out the bad way and uh, he had to take you home. All right? So I hope that is understood. Then I want you to go to the book of Revelation chapter 7, verse 2. But uh, yeah, but of course we can, we can uh, read verse 1 also. <clears throat> because here, uh, no, I hope you understand, we are talking about an angel with a seal of the living God. And that seal is a seal of security. And uh, it is not really the angel we're talking about, but it is the job that the angel have. He is sent out to help out the people that he, God has created before the foundation of the world. <coughs> we know that he, today we have 7.5 7 billion people on earth. And uh, how many people that have lived on earth before that time, I really don't have the numbers. But uh, maybe we have had 5 billion people on earth or 6 billion people on earth uh, up till now that are dead and gone. And now we have 7.5 that's living. That's a lot of people. But God, he has a program and he has a creation for every single soul that he wanted to put feet on earth. He wanted to give them life. And he also included every soul that is going to be born in the millennium kingdom. So God knows every soul that's ever going to be born, born here on earth. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, don't, we don't know them. We hardly know anyone. <laughs> we just know a handful. But God knows them all. And he knows the timing for them to come into this world and the timing to leave this place. So that's solemnly in his hands. All right. So then when the Lord is giving people security, a seal. And I read here in uh, Revelation 7, and it says, I, After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or any tree. So here there's four angels. And really those angels, they are the spiritual beings that are controlling the peace of the earth. So that mankind is not going to get out of hand. Right? So the angels are, and you say, well, but we have had world wars. Millions of people have died. Well, yeah, hey, the second world war took uh, 65 million people. But Mao Zedong in China took 250 million people alone. <laughs> and that was after the Second World War. Yeah. And when you look at Pol Pot and you look at the, the Russian communistic regime, they took about 100 million 
uh, in the communistic, uh, in name of communism. So hey, my, we got so many people that are killed off. But remember, God knows every one of them. So everyone is going to be taken care of. You might say, oh, he didn't take care of them here in life. Oh, yes, he did. And whether they died early or late, remember, your main objective is, do you have eternal life? Because uh, 60, 70, 80 years here on earth is nothing. Of course, it's all for us because we're living now. But when it comes to comparing to eternity, my, it's not uh, just a little dusty corn on a sand beach considering all the beach that there is. <laughs> my, I tell you, if you are destined for eternal life, you got it made. And if not, then you better get there so that you can get it made. <laughs> yeah. Make sure you are on talking terms with the Almighty One. Because uh, that's the best thing you can do. All right, so here it speaks about angels that are holding the winds of conflict. So that the world don't get com completely out of hand. But uh, Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 24, he mentioned that, uh, remember, there is a tragic moment coming. And it's going to be a tribulation that has never ever faced the earth before and shall never come again. And that's still ahead of us. The greatest tribulation has not yet come on this earth. Even Mao Zedong took uh, 250 million. Adolf Hitler was an instrumental for 65 million. And those numbers are small, considering what is coming. So uh, remember now, I, I, I don't walk around and I don't uh, travel around to tell the people about the big scenarios coming. And my job is to uh, to make you sure that you are in communication with the Lord. Right? So you look up. And uh, I, not that you're going to forget about the tragics that uh, are coming to the world. But remember, uh, with all the power that you have, you cannot stop what's coming. Hey, it was told 2,000 years ago it's coming. And it's still coming. Because Jesus saw it and he was just telling us, be alert, be ready, because it is coming. But what you need to do is to be, get close with God. And if you get filled with the Holy Spirit, as he proclaimed you needed, then you will also escape the greatest tribulation of them all. Because there is a secret catching away of the believers that have stayed and walked close with God. And it's not just for you to escape the Great Tribulation. It's just that's God's program. That's what He is going to do. Because there's a lot of Christians that's going to go through the Great Tribulation. Because you have, when you read the Scriptures, you find out that you have two Scriptures in the Bible speaking about the rapture. Or some people say there is no rapture in the Bible. Okay, if there is no, would you agree there is a catching away? Right? Because that's what they shall be caught in the air. Yeah. So whether you call it rapture or catching away, suit yourself. It is actually the same thing. So th there might be words that are not written out that we are using in our English or Norwegian terminology. But when it comes to what God is doing, it really means the same thing. So don't be too particular on things, and you might really confuse the picture for even for your own self. So, so that's a very important thing. Okay, uh, Ephesians 4, we said, sealed with the Holy Ghost. Then here in verse 2, Then I saw another angel. Ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. Hmm. An angel with a seal. Seal of the living God. Mm -hmm. 
And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were, say, were sealed. Amen. Well, uh, this, this is my little notebook, so I didn't uh, quote all the scripture of the Bible. <laughs> <coughs> so I just uh, chopped it up in sections because I want to explain a certain thing. So here, there is an angel. And of course, we're not worshippers of angels. I hope you understand that. So even if we mention angels in the Bible, they're just written out there. So you have to acknowledge God is using instruments to help you and me out. And if the Lord would open up our eyes, like he did the, the prophet said to the Lord, when the Syrian army was all around him and, a, and his servant thought this is the end of our life. Because who can escape from this mighty army? And the Lord, uh, the prophet said to the, to the Lord, Lord, can you show the servant what I see? And then the Lord opened the eyes of the servant and he saw angels camped around them. So now the angel got, I mean the servant got bold <laughs> because now he understood why the prophet could be so calm. Uh, this morning when we had our little Bible study, I was talking a little about the, uh, the other sense, because we have five senses that we can use to protect our body, but there is an extra sense that God is using to communicate with us. And I'll say the more you get in communication with God Almighty, through the sixth sense, the more secure you are. Because now, if you could see what God has in store for you, what kind of protection you have. Remember, this world is full of devils. I know that. But I really don't consider the devils too much. That, that's not my, my, my thing to worry about. I consider what God has as a protection. Because when God comes to protect me, then there is no devil on earth that can come and outrun that. He is going to be there, protect and help me so that I can fulfill the course that he put upon me to, to do. And uh, I'm very happy for that. And I have not seen uh, angels. I have not seen devils like multiple. Uh, I have had experiences where I have seen the bad side, the bad spirit. And I have uh, heard the voice of the Lord to, uh, to protect me and help me so that I can say, praise the Lord. Uh, I am protected. So therefore, I can keep smiling even if it doesn't look like I should smile. Because I the Lord opened up the sixth sense in my life. Yeah. And uh, by dream, <coughs> dreams and visions, he helps you to see what you're coming up against. And he tells you, be calm, just be quiet. Let me do the job <coughs> and uh, you'll be okay. So therefore you don't need to, hand, uh, to use your fist against the devil. <laughs> and you don't even need to use the fist against your enemies. You can even love them. The more you see all the sixth sense, the more you will love your enemies because you will see how great a protection there is upon your life. So here, there's an angel coming. And when you look at Revelation 7 verse 2, you have to look at John the Apostle. He was a prisoner on the Isle of Patmos. He was about 95, 96 years old, maybe. God knows. But he was closer to 100 than 20 anyway. And here the Lord appears to him and he gives him a vision. And in chapter, when you read Revelation chapter 4, 
really the angel of the Lord speaks to John and he says, come up hither. And that terminology, I think most of the Christian world, when they read the Bible, you, anyway among the Pentecostal people, they believe that John was caught up in the air. He was caught up in the spirit. Remember, to be caught up in the spirit doesn't mean uh, that the man disappears from the earth. You have stories of William Branham. He was laying in bed and was thinking about heaven. And uh, he thought he was going to be, he was an older man, no. And then suddenly the Lord picked him up and uh, brought him into a different dimension. And he was looking down on earth and he saw himself laying in the bed. <laughs> the old man was laying in bed and here he was also, and he was doing like this and said, oh my, I got hair on my top here. <laughs> hey, that's what I'm waiting on to <laughs> one day. I'm gonna got hair on there on the top. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so here he was in bed, but he was also in a different dimension. All right, I don't want to elab elaborate too much on it, <coughs> but that happened with Brother Branham, and that's uh, recently. Uh, John, the apostle, uh, 2,000 years ago about, he uh, had the same experience. If you go back to Ezekiel, you find out that Ezekiel was also picked up in the spirit and brought to Jerusalem, and he saw the fall, he saw the temple burnt, the walls of Jerusalem torn down, and he was brought back to the river of Sebar in Babylon, where he really belonged, because he was a prisoner there. And uh, about a week or two later, people from Israel came, and they came grieved and grieved of sorrow, because they were going to tell the prophet what had happened in Jerusalem. And Ezekiel said, I, I already know I've been there. <laughs> so he was there in the spirit, and so it happened. Well, praise the Lord. So here, John, when he is now caught up in chapter 4, then the Lord brings him in, in time. He can, you're, when you are in the Spirit, God can show you any time He wants. He can show you the present hour you're living in. He can bring you back in history and show you what happened. <laughs> and He can bring you up in the future. To show you what is going to happen. And that basically was what John the Apostle was able to see by the grace of God. So when you come to chapter 7 and verse 2. And he says there, I saw. And then he saw again in verse 2. An angel coming with the living seal of God. And that means he was brought to the time that for us is still the future. Because what John saw there in chapter 7 verse 2 has not really happened yet. It is still a prophecy. Uh, but that tells me God is in full control. So I'm very happy that John could see. And he, he saw the bride coming down. Hey, that's farther up the road. So uh, John was helped to see things so that the body of Christ, when they start to read what he saw, they can be comforted and say, my Lord, this is what is in store for us. Ah. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the book of Revelation is really a comfortable or a book of comfort for you and me. Yeah. Just make sure we are on the right side of life, <laughs> filled with, the God, with God's Holy Spirit. All right, so I looked here and I see an angel coming. And that angel, he comes with the seal of the living God. And the seal of the living God is really nothing else but the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Because that is what brings and gives people eternal life. Praise God. All right. So then we can go to another scripture and we can go to back to Genesis. In the book of Genesis, we find out 
that God spoke to Adam and Eve. Well, in the beginning he spoke to Adam, but he spoke to Adam in the spirit. Right? Remember, you might say Adam was created first and Eve later on, but that is a sequence of event because we are all created before the Garden of Eden in Christ. You have to put it like this. When God looked at creation, everyone that we was going to create, and then he saw the downfall of man, he saw sin, disobedience, he saw mortality, because he had to put them under that law of mortality. But he also saw that there was one that would stand the test, no matter the cost. And that was Jesus Christ. Yeah. So Jesus Christ, he was all ready. Remember, sometimes people say Jesus Christ was the slain lamb of God before the foundation of the world. Right? And in the mind and eyes of God he was, but he was not the slain lamb before he was slain. But in foreknowledge it was. Right? right? And you and I, hey, I was a worldly boy at 16. At 17 I heard the voice of the Lord, and at 18 I turned to him. Right? So, but w when I was 15, I didn't know that I was chosen before the foundation of the world. Right? I was just a worldly boy do doing my things. But then when he revealed and started to uh, give me understanding I needed to walk with the Lord, and I turned to him, and I said, I accept. Then later on when I start reading the Bible, I find out that I was really predestined before the foundation of the world. But I don't go around and say I was predestined when I was 15 years old and bragging about I'm, one day I'm going to turn to the Lord. I didn't even know the Lord at that time. So therefore, we have to stay humble and uh, don't act like we know everything here on earth or in heaven. <clears throat> okay, so therefore, when the angel comes and he is having the seal, what is the seal? All right, then when you go back to the beginning, when Adam and Eve, they failed to obey God, they came in, in under disobedience, and they caused mortality to come into their flesh. And the Lord said, if you disobey me, you shall surely die. And really, he said, you're going to die the death. An Old Testament or an old way of description, die the death. That means dying two times. Right? And we are living now, and we're going to die one day, every one of us. Right? If the Lord doesn't come, you'll go to the grave. And uh, whatever is in the ground is going to eat you up. <laughs> and you wouldn't even know it. <coughs> because you're dead and gone from your body. But your soul and your spirit is still alive. Yeah. And God keeps that soul alive with his spirit. So you go to a place, hopefully, it is heaven. Right? The right dimension. And you're going to be there until judgment day comes. Or whatever uh, election there is upon your life. I'll just put it like this for now. So therefore, you will never die the second times, the second time, just uh, randomly, uh, accidentally. The second death is really the lake of fire. And the lake of fire will consume your soul, your personality, your work, your deeds, and everything you've done, and will separate the soul from the Spirit of God, because the Spirit of God is a gift given to you. You have the Spirit of God in you. Yeah. Whether you're born again or not. Even the devil has the Spirit of God. <laughs> right? But we, we don't call it the Spirit of God, but it is the life-giving Spirit that God gives to anything that's going to live. Right? That's, that's uh, his privilege to give life to everyone. 
and then he will test us to see if we will want to walk with him. And if we choose to walk with him and choose to uh, follow his uh, commandments, the, the way that he teaches us, then that spirit will never be taken out of your soul and you will live eternally. Praise the Lord. So the lake of fire is only for the bad seed. They who choose to refuse to want to walk with the Lord. But the ones who desire to walk with him, all right, when he takes his spirit back, you, f you follow with it. Because he don't want to separate you from him. And that, that, hey, that's a wonderful security to have. All right, so here, <clears throat> remember when Adam got life from God, God breathed the breath of life into his nostrils and he became a living soul. And right there, and I, when I started reading the Bible, I always uh, wondered about this thing. Here Adam is given life by God and I thought that life was eternal, right? And here he is told that if you do wrong, you will not have eternal life. But I also read in the scriptures that if you're given eternal life, then that life will never be taken away from you. Right? Yeah. So therefore, I started understanding that God wants to test mankind. You and I are going to be tested. He gives us enough of his spirit so that you become functionable uh, and you can be on talking terms with God. Sure can. Yeah. And then when time comes for the test to be upon your life, then there comes a time where you may have to make a choice. And when you choose right, then the Lord will seal you. Yeah. And he seals you in your lifetime. But remember, in God's foreknowledge, if you read Romans chapter 8, verse 29 and 30, you find out that in God's foreknowledge you were predestined for eternal life, right? Because he saw that you would one day in 1968 make a choice to walk with him. He saw that. And he also saw if you would stay to your commitment until the day you die. Right? So he saw, he has seen the last day of the last soul that's ever going to be born on earth. So he knows all about that. But you and I, we don't know all about that. That's why we face strugglings. Hey, when, whenever you have problems, you don't say, praise God, I have eternal life. No, you say, I got a problem. Yeah, and don't come here now. I'm frustrated, right? <laughs> I'm mad or something like that. So therefore, you start acting because of your emotions. Your mind is down on the five senses. You don't give the sixth sense any, <laughs> any help. <laughs> yeah. You don't have time for that now because you've got a problem. But God wants you to stay with him in that sixth sense. That is what was the difference with Jesus Christ. He, he always stayed in the sixth sense, always communicating with the Father. He said, I can do nothing unless my Father shows me. So all the deeds, all the works, all the places he went to was ordained. Don't we also say that our footsteps are ordained? Huh? I think that we have a tendency to say that because they actually are. God knows how many times you're going to go to this place, that place, how many people you're going to meet. He knows every uh, conversation you're ever going to have. But you are not worried, you're not nervous, you're not shook up as, oh, how many more do I have, Lord, before this is all over? You would never know because God will inspire you and help you to take the right choices. Yeah. So therefore, whether you are 20, 50, 70, or 90 years old, he puts life in you 
and he makes you ready for the next challenge. Hallelujah. And as long as that goes on, you're under his protection. All right. Okay, back to the Garden of Eden. Here, when Adam sinned, the Lord said something. He said in uh, chapter 3 in Genesis, he says, Behold, uh, it's in chapter 3, verse 22 to 24. Yeah. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And no less to put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Hmm. So the tree of life was there. It has always been there. And the tree of life is actually the spiritual law of the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Cannot be anything else. That spiritual law, if you eat of the tree of life, you will live eternally. When you get filled with the Holy Ghost, you will live eternally. Yeah. So that's why I read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Sealed with the Holy Ghost. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit in which you're sealed to the day of redemption. And in Revelation chapter 7, Verse 2, here is this angelic being coming in with the living seal of God. Praise the Lord. It's the same spirit, the same spiritual law. It is the tree of life on the move. <laughs> you say, can the spirit tree of life move? Of course it can. Remember, when you got filled with the Holy Spirit... A part of the tree of life is in you. Because it is not a branch, it is not leaf, it is not a wooden stock. It is a spiritual law that God produces and makes sure that his believers, his children that are going to have eternal life, gets filled with that spirit. Praise the Lord. So here he speaks... In Genesis chapter 3 and in verse 23 therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken so he drove out the man and he placed angels he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life because once someone eat of the tree of life, they will live eternally. And that is the warning that God said back in the Garden of Eden. He told Adam, he, he said it to the angelic world, because when the Lord said, let us make, right? It's not a trinity. It is not two gods. There's only one God, but God has a creation. And he created angels, and they are there to assist him when it comes to the work of the salvation of mankind. Hallelujah. So therefore, he spoke to the angelic world. And one of them was a cherubim that had the main job to protect the entrance to the tree of life. Because nobody could eat of that tree of life <coughs> or that spiritual law in the condition that the sinful man was in. That's why God spoke to Adam and he said to him, I'm putting my words into this, and he said, Adam, you failed, but I will provide another Adam and he will come and he will restore the road back to the tree of life. And when he restores it back, then everyone can receive that spirit. But until then, it's going to be a cherub, an angelic being, that's going to hinder people to go right in and eat of the tree of life. <coughs> but he said, Adam, 
if you believe in that, uh, in that second Adam to come, then you shall also uh, receive eternal life based on believing in the coming Adam, which was the Lord Jesus Christ. And then God told Adam and said, as a token that you believe that this Adam is to come, and you believe that, I want you to offer a sacrifice. Take a lamb, kill it, and sacrifice it as a token that you believe in the coming Messiah. And Adam did that. When Abel saw that, he said, I'll do just like Dad. And later on, he offered a sacrifice, the very same thing. And God accepted it. Then when Cain saw that, he said, I'm going to offer a sacrifice too. But I'm not going to use a lamb. I'm going to do other things. And he offered fruits of the grain. And he offered it to the Lord. And there was no voice in heaven, no sound from heaven. And Cain got angry and said, what? <laughs> what? And the Lord came down and said, why are you angry? Because if you do the right thing, <laughs> like if you offer the same sacrifice as a token, you believe in the coming Christ, you will be accepted too. But Cain, he did not want, he protested and said, I don't want to do that. He didn't believe in a second Adam. So therefore, he walked out and ended up killing his brother. Yeah. So that's why Cain became a type for the afterworld. Cain was of the evil one because he did not accept what God had put up as a remedy for mankind. And then, <clears throat> um, I'm not going to read everything out loud to you, but if you have pen and pencil, or uh, uh, paper, I mean, I mean pen and paper, uh, if, you go, if you go to 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 6 to 11, you will find out that uh, Solomon, uh, he was the one who built a temple. And when he had done, built the temple, he stood before the Lord and he was praying and seeking God for God to bless the temple. And then the Shekinah glory or the presence of the Lord came down and they built a temple with a holy and the holiest of holiest, uh, an inner chamber that would be a type where God would meet the people. And the type is really that in that inner holiest of holiest would be the tree of life. Or the spirit of the tree of life. Because the tree of life is not a tree, it is the spirit of God. So it represents eternal life. Yeah. And the high priest would go into the holiest of holiest once a year. And if he was accepted by God, then uh, yeah, he would live, <laughs> he would survive. But if he had done something that he was not supposed to and he came into the holiest of holiest, the Lord killed him. <laughs> and they put a rope around his, uh, his stomach so that in fact, we, if he died, they could not go in there because everyone who goes in there would die. <laughs> and they took that rope and they dragged the, man, the dead man out. <laughs> It's a, it's a scenario. But uh, hey, that's how holy God was Amen. and is. Uh, so therefore, here in 1 Kings, the representation of the tree of life was in the holiest of holy. There you would find him. But of course, he's invisible. Yeah. And it's only represented there. And if you go to Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 21 to 24. There you find out, remember, it's many years now from the Garden of Eden and uh, until Solomon built a temple. And then here Ezekiel, before the temple, is burnt down. 
Nebuchadnezzar is about to come in and he's going to take the city and burn down the temple. And here you read in chapter 11 how the Spirit of God comes out of the temple. There's the wheel in the wheel. The, the, the power of God comes out. And Ezekiel saw it. And how that it came out of the temple, lifted itself up, and left the city. So now, and remember, that temple, whatever they built up again, that Shekinah glory never came back in again. Because now, they had sinned against God in such a way that it would not rebuild that scene that the Spirit of God came back in. But, <clears throat> later, just 500 years later, the Lord is sending, Je or God is sending in Jesus Christ, the second Adam, the perfect Son of God, the only begotten. And when he started, when he came to the river of Jordan, and John the Baptist baptized him there, then the Shekinah glory, or the Spirit of God, or the Holy Ghost, came down and filled him. And that's why the Bible says, Jesus Christ was filled with the fullness of God bodily. Hey, that is what Adam could have done if he had obeyed God. He could have ate of the tree of life and lived eternally. But he failed, and now it had to come to Jesus Christ to come and rebuild and bring mankind back in reconciliation with God. So here is where the Holy Spirit comes down for the first time and fills a person. Then Jesus is using his three, three and a half years of ministry to teach the disciples about the coming of the Lord and the coming of the Comforter. That is nothing else but the Holy Spirit. And then when he had died and resurrected, he speaks to the disciples and he tells them clearly, they say, stay in the city until you are filled with Holy Spirit. Don't start a missionary journey now without the Holy Spirit inside you. And the people went on the upper room and they stayed there for 10 days waiting on the power to come. And on the day of Pentecost, hallelujah, here the Spirit comes down in the shape of flames of fire and it fills all the 120 souls in the upper room. So that is actually the Spirit of, tree, of the tree of life that was in the Garden of Eden and it was hindered by cherubims but now it is opened up and when Jesus Christ died on the cross on Calvary then it says that in the temple there was a curtain right a holy curtain and it was split in two from up to down and on that curtain it was really a brodery or a figure of a cherubim guarding the way into the holiest of holiest right so here, the type in Revelation, I mean in Genesis 3, 23, cherubims guarding into the tree of life. And now when Jesus gave the, his life, that was split in two and done away with. That means now anyone can go in there. Of course, you have to die because the Bible says, repent, die. Be baptized, get buried, and then when you're sure dead and buried, you can go in and you can get filled with the Holy Ghost. But of course, they didn't know, need to go into a temple. They didn't know, need to go to Jerusalem to do that part. God just uh, annulled the pro prohibition so that now it was open. So wherever the gospel is preached, now the Holy Ghost can come into any person who truly give up their life and want to live with the Lord. Alright? 
So therefore, in chapter 11, Ezekiel, the, the Spirit of God leaves the temple and really never comes back again. And whatever they have as a temple and the holiest of holiest back in the days of Jesus Christ, remember Jesus Christ did not really pay much attention to the temple. Because when, when the disciples looked at the temple and said, Lord, look at the magnificent thing here. And the Lord said, there shall not be left a stone upon a stone of this place. It's all going to go because it doesn't have any value anymore. Now the Spirit of God is not going to live hid by stones and in a holy place so that the people can hinder you to, uh, to, uh, to get in and receive the Spirit of God. Now it's going to be an incidence where the Holy Spirit will come down on any person that is claiming the Lord. <coughs> so therefore, on the day of Pentecost, here the Holy Spirit comes and really it is the action of the tree of life starting to entering into every human soul that are accepting the gospel. Isn't that wonderful? Hallelujah. And now the Spirit of God through that Holy Spirit, the office of the Holy Spirit is now leading the body of Christ so that the message can go to the end of the world. I don't know how much longer I can preach here. <laughs> my, my mind is so full of... <laughs> <laughs> so you say, Brother Strowman always uh, preach long. That's because uh, I, I can't get finished. <laughs> but uh, you can stop me and say, Brother Strowman, that's enough for tonight. <laughs> right? <laughs> but I'll just continue a little more, a few minutes, hopefully. <laughs> and the gospel starts with filling the 120, then 3,000, then 5,000. And so the city of Jerusalem is really in a turmoil. And the Pharisees and the scribes, they're so mad, they want to do away with anything that has the name of Jesus on it. And they start a great persecution. And the believers have to get out of the city. And they start traveling. And really what they're doing, they're fulfilling the commandment of the Lord. Because the message, the gospel, shall be preached to the end of the world. That was what Jesus said in Matthew 28. Preach the gospel. Go out. Do the job. Yeah. And they, and in Mark chapter 16, they who believe and are, and are baptized shall be saved. And on and on you can go on there. But here in Jerusalem, the people are fleeing out of the city. And the first city that, you're, that are mentioned in the Bible in the New Testament is really the city of Antioch. And here is where the people first were called Christians. And there was a big revival there. And when you go to Acts chapter 13, you find out that Barnabas, he was there and helping out. And he went to Tarsus to pick up Paul, to seek for him so he could find him. Because he knew that Paul had a very good understanding of the scriptures. And he went to Tarsus and brought him to Antioch. And they started teaching there. And there was a revival in that city. But then while they were doing the ministry in Antioch, the Holy Spirit came. Chapter 13, verse 2, I think. Book of Acts. And it says, Take out from among you Saul and Barnabas to the work they're appointed to do. And here they laid hands upon them. And they sent them out for the first missionary journey. And they started their missionary journey, as you can read on in the chapters following. From chapter 13 to 15, they made the first journey. Then in chapter 15, 16, they started on the second journey. And on. And of course, conflicts and stuff like that, we're going to leave that alone. But then in chapter 19, Paul comes to Ephesus. And there is where he's speaking to the people and saying, Did you receive the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they didn't even know about the Holy Spirit. And he asked what baptism, and he found out it was John the Baptist. Uh, it was his baptism they had 
been following and his teachings. And then G Paul is instructing them in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it became a great revival in Asia Minor. And all the seven churches that you re read about later in the book of Revelation was really a result of Paul's uh, fiery gospel that went all around Asia Minor. Yeah. Until he had a dream in chapter 16. One morning he came up and he told his uh, friends, companions in the Lord and said, the Lord spoke to me. I saw in a dream there was a man in Macedonia. And he cried and said, come over and help us. <laughs> and when so Paul said that, the Bible says we all understood the Lord had called us. Hey, they identified themselves with Paul. Yeah. Amen. And they went to Macedonia. They went to Europe. <laughs> yeah. And started there. And then they went to Philippi, to Thessalonica, to Athens, to Corinth. And they had a big, and Berea, and they had a big revival in those places. Ah, Europe started, and the Holy Ghost was there. Really, what the Holy Ghost did, or should we say, what the angel with the seal of the living God did, he was inspiring the people to go westbound. That is what he did. Yeah. So the spirit, the angel of the Lord was inspiring. And remember when you read the book of Acts, you'll find out that uh, Paul, he tried to go to another city, he tried to go to Pamphylia, but the Holy Spirit didn't allow him to go in there. So therefore, and of course, they probably met resistance so that they couldn't go in. But it says in the Bible, the Holy Spirit did not allow them. But it allowed them to go into Macedonia and further de deeper in. And then the gospel went to Rome. <laughs> As you already know, when Paul <coughs> was, uh, was a prisoner, we jump over a lot of history now. <laughs> when he was a prisoner in Israel, the Lord said to him, you shall also see the emperor. And then Paul knew that he would end up in Rome as well. And he also wrote in one of his letters that he was on his way to Rome, but he was really on his way to Spain. But I want to go also and come and visit Rome on my way to Spain. But we know through the scriptures that Paul never made it to Spain. He was beheaded in Rome, but that doesn't stop the work of the Holy Spirit. That angelic power went into Europe and there was a great revival in the, one of the cities in France called Lyon. Yeah. And the gospel spread all over Europe. Germany, Holland, Belgium. Uh, back in those days probably was called Frank. <laughs> right? But uh, today the modern uh, countries that we have was uh, really reached with the gospel. And it was the angel with the living seal of God that had come into Europe. And it went into England and they had a great revival in Wales, uh, Evan Roberts. Uh, back in them days, hey, there was a mighty manifestation of the Spirit in those days. And then the message went into America and it came here. And the angel of the Lord was here and inspired people for about 150 to 200 years. And William Branham, one of the great ministers and one of the greatest ever, he was preaching the gospel. And one time in the late 50s, he was standing in the midst of the people and he said, there is a warning upon America. You have to repent now or the Lord will take his candle light and move on. Or he also said, the Lord will take his angel. What angel was it? It's really the angel back in Genesis chapter 3, in Ezekiel chapter 11, and in Ezekiel chapter 43, I never mentioned that to you, but I don't, and in Ezekiel chapter 47, 
Now, uh, in chapter 3, uh, 23, uh, 43, from verse 1 to 7, and Ezekiel 47, from verse 1 to 12, if you want to write it down. Right? Just to, so that you have a sequence how the angel of the Lord was working before Jesus Christ came. And here in the 50s, Brother Branham is warning America and say, if you don't repent now, the Lord will move his candle. The light, ah, the ignition, the spark of the Holy Spirit. And America did not receive it. They fell asleep, lukewarm. The Laodicean church age that we are living in is a lukewarm time. And the angel went out in the Pacific Ocean, <laughs> crossing over into the Far East. And here, in the far, when I came to the Lord in 1967 and 68, I start, when I started reading, I went to some bookstores, I bought a Bible, and I bought some literature because I wanted to know what's going on today. <laughs> what is the Spirit doing today? And I found some literature about a revival in Indonesia, a revival in the Far East. And that was in the late 60s. Hey, Brother Branham had passed on in 1965. Yeah. And he had already told them about eight years before that this angel, if you don't repent, the angel will move on. And I read about revivals in Australia, in, so, in, uh, in Korea. Uh, one of the biggest churches in the world is located in Seoul, Korea. They have more than 700,000 people in the church. <laughs> My Lord. So, there must have been quite a revival, right? And in the Philippines and Indonesia, hey, there was such a great move. So when, uh, when I came with Brother Jackson to Philippines in 1996, we could see that there was such a respect for God. There was really a joyful spirit in the people. And we have lots of people coming to church. Hey, we're just a small group of people, you know. Uh, they that believe that Branham was a prophet to the end time, they are shunned all over the world. We are called false doctrine and false prophets. and We're, we're everything with false behind it. <laughs> yeah. But hey, don't worry about that. If you're sure the Holy Ghost is leading you, then let the people talk. Yeah. Because that's, that's, hey, that's their... That's their entertainment to, to belittle you. But you have another thing to do. Lift up the Spirit of Christ in your life and do it the best way you know to. So, I saw there that the Spirit of God had moved to the Far East. And why do I say this tonight? Because we started out reading Revelation Chapter 7, verse 2. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east. Really, if the gospel is going to preach to the end of the world, where is the end of the world? Who said it? Jesus Christ, right? And if he's going to preach, if, he, if that message is going to go to the end of the world, where is the end then? I live in Norway, you live here. You might say that Chile, the tip of uh, the South America, that's the end of that part of the world. <laughs> and you can go those things. But really, the end of the world is really where the gospel starts. Right? It's going to go and have a full effect all the way to the end. So therefore, the gospel starts in Jerusalem and it goes westbound. Go through Europe, England, America, comes back in, into the Far East. And the angel is coming from the rising of the sun. He's coming in from the East. And he's coming where? To go back into Israel. To complete the job. To be a light to the Jews. So therefore, and lately, when, uh, when I hear some testimonies, I hear testimonies of people 
in the Middle East, in Syria, in Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia and places, Muslim people are having visions and dreams about Jesus Christ. Ah. So that tells me there is a revival going on. It might not be a revival so that 700,000 in one church will, <laughs> will be in, in service in Saudi Arabia. I don't know. Uh, but I don't care about that. I just care about, Lord, are you now fulfilling the journey to the end of the world? That means that inspiration, that angel with the, living, the seal of the living God is though almost back in the Middle East, in Israel. But it hasn't gone into Israel yet because we have the two prophets in Revelation chapter 11 is going to preach and they're going to be instrumental for the angel coming in in chapter 7, Revelation 7. After verse 2, it speaks about 144,000 Jews that's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Some people told me, can people be filled with the Holy Spirit after the rapture? I said, God is never going to take the Holy Spirit off the world, off the earth. Because there's people that's going to be saved. After the bride is gone. Sure. Absolutely. There's people going to be saved. Because when uh, you talk about the rapture or the catching away, that's 1 Corinthians 15. That's 1 Thessalonians 4. It is not Revelation 20 verse 4. That is later. That is after the great tribulation. So Revelation 20 verse 4 is the summary of everything that have believed in God and are being appointed to eternal life. Praise God. So here in chapter 7 verse 2, the angel is coming back after a worldwide trip that have taken about 2,000 years. And you might say, well, where did he go? Where did that angel go? Well, remember, I was in Norway in 1967, and the angel of the Lord with the great seal of God had left Europe a long time ago. <laughs> right? But that doesn't mean that a person cannot be filled with the Holy Ghost. It's just that the big revival, the sensational revivals are not there. Now you are saved individually. Well, of course they were saved individually in revivals too. But here, you could have 500 people saved in an evening service. Now you're lucky if one comes to the, to the Lord and give their life to the Lord. Right? If, you're, if you have two people serving the Lord, coming and giving their lives, oh my, we had a revival here. <laughs> right? <laughs> so that, that tells us the difference. Because the angel has left, Few people feel pricked in their hearts. And if you talk to them, they might say, oh, you're crazy. And they just go on. But the Lord, and when he says, this gospel is going to be preached to the end of the world. Then you point out the starting point of where the gospel starts. And you follow the trail. And that's what we have done tonight. We follow the trail where the Lord has brought revivals on the earth till it is back in Israel again. And now it is in the Middle East saving people. Muslim people are receiving Jesus Christ and they decide to leave their families. Uh, fathers and mothers say to people that start to follow Jesus, you're not my son anymore. To me, you're dead. <laughs> you know, some of them, they even find a, a stone, a gravestone, and they put the name of their son that become a Christian, and now he's dead. And they put the point of death on the person because they don't want him as a son. He's a shame to the Muslim family. Hey, that's what's going on. But you know those people that meet Jesus, they don't care. You can call me dead, you can put up as many stones as you want with my name on it. I am alive for Christ. And I'm dead to this world. And I hope that we can be a person 
that can recognize that the spirit of the tree of life, which is nothing else but the Holy Spirit, filled Jesus Christ with the fullness of the Godhead and filled us according to the measure of faith because we are still mortal beings. Jesus Christ didn't have that problem. But you and I, if we, if we get too, should we say, if we see too much power through our lives, we have a tendency to make ourselves kings, right? We, we become very important people. That's why the Lord, in His wisdom, gives us a portion so we don't lift ourselves above what we're called to do. Yeah. I remember Paul, he said also, I even received an angel that hit me yeah. to keep me on a low state because I have seen so much. I had a great revelation and I could even make myself boastful because of all the things that I've seen in the spirit. And here comes the devil to keep him low. <laughs> and, and Paul said, well, I just have to accept it. Yeah. But I'm going to preach Christ, whether it is for popularity or whatever comes upon my life. And I pray that we can do our part, whether we have much revelation, less revelation. If we have a lot, we've seen a lot or little, doesn't really matter as long as we fulfill what he have inspired into our lives. So, the angel with the seal of the living God is really carrying the message of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And it goes around the globe and it's fulfilled by the time the two prophets start in Israel and then it, the time of the Gentiles will be over. Some people ask me, are there not going to be any Gentiles saved when uh, the gospel goes back to the Jews? Well, uh, you can ask the other question. Did any Jew got saved in the days of the Gentile dispensation? And you have to say, yes. Hey, it started with Jews. Started with Peter, Paul, James, John, and all the others. They were really the key to unlock the gospel to Gentiles. And if there is a Gentile seeking God, I believe God will respond. The only thing God needs is an honest heart, an honest cry, a humble walk. And if you're a Gentile in the days of the Jews, God will still accept you. But hey, remember now, you have the best time right now because God is dealing with the Gentiles still. It's, the time glass is running out, but uh, it's not completely dry yet. And I hope and pray that we can do our part of the job until the angel goes in there. And the catching away is before us. But we're not going to go into that now. I hope that you will. And thank you for bearing with me. I am so happy for the opportunity. I hope that something is said that can uh, uh, increase your Bible reading <laughs> and our understanding. Because this, to me, became a wonderful understanding of the scriptures. I'm rejoicing over the things the Lord shows and there's much more to come. May the Lord bless you. Praise the Lord. Brother Tim. Hallelujah. Are you still happy? Amen. All right. Hey, you sung a song, Mike. I'm happy every day. Yeah. Right? You, can you change it and say, I'm still happy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs>
After that sermon, we could all sing, I'm one of them. Yeah. And if you're not, you can be. There are people almost everywhere whose hearts are all the same.
you happy if you got your name in the book of life probably beyond happy it's a beautiful message we heard tonight the Lord is sealing people filling them with his spirit I remember it was some years back and a brother was here and we asked the question about you know what happens after the bride is taken can a Gentile be saved and the answer really was no no that's not possible and um, you know people use the term Christ is off the mercy seat and and they made it seem like the world had just went into utter darkness but like brother Stroman said tonight wherever a heart can reach out to God because you know even in the Old Testament people that were outside of the promises of God God would reach out and he'd grab this one and he'd grab that one and bring them in. And when he was saying that, I thought about this. It's in Revelation 14, 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. You know what? That's to everybody. And I don't believe that angel is going or that gospel is going to preach to people just to tell them, oh, you missed it too late. It's always the gospel is the good news. It is an offer that if you can only believe. I've often thought this. The hundred, the, we read about the sheep and the goats. I don't believe they come out of an hour of time and not know anything about God. Too many warnings in that hour. Too many. I mean, if these men are going to go throughout the world and start, tell what God is doing, no doubt those people will hear that. And God was able to touch a heart. Hey, they'll never be part of the Bride of Christ. It's gone. It's already completed. Um, but where they fit, God knows. Uh, but the main thing is, they fit. Amen. So that's what we thank God for. Let's all stand together. We'll go to the Lord in prayer. Remember us. We'll be in Chicago this weekend. Be in Cincinnati tomorrow night. Um, and in Chicago Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then uh, services start here next Thursday. Next Wednesday during the day, we'll have Bible study again. Uh, we really had a good time today. Um, just kind of sitting around talking about the goodness of God and opening up the scriptures and, and uh, a nice time of fellowship. I know many people have to work, but the ones that don't, you're more than welcome to join us. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're thankful that you brought our brother and sister this way, Lord. That you make a way, Lord, for them to travel, Lord, and you... Lord, you give them health and strength and body, Lord. And Lord, once more, they've got a journey set up before them, Lord. Lord, you know what's around every corner, Lord. You know what needs to be said in every place. Lord, to touch a heart, to change a situation, to uplift the people, Lord. Lord, my brother doesn't know all the people he's going to meet. 
Lord, you know them. You know their struggles, Lord, and their triumphs. And Lord, thou art able to take a soul, Lord, and, and to speak to their heart through one of thy vessels. And that's what we really desire, Lord. Lord, not to just to have service and come, Lord, as any other time, but Lord, that we may come and receive of thee. So Lord, guide our pathway and our, our steps, O Lord, and let it be ordered of thee and be with us, Lord. Bless thy people, Lord. You see the ones that stand in need, each and every one. I just pray that you'd be with them, for thou art the one that supplies our every need. We trust in that, Lord. Maybe not our every want, but Lord, thou art working something in our life, Lord, preparing us for a kingdom to come. So, Lord, let us be attentive and mindful of thy voice and always strive to be obedient. Lord, bless thy people, and we give you thanks for this night. In the precious name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen.